Well, good to be back with you today. Um, Excited to be here. And there's good news all around. We are the church, right? We're not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who would believe. You're the church. I'm the church. We're the church. I would say this to you this morning. Life is good. Life is good. Being a child of God. That's where I left you a few weeks back in uh, Romans chapter 8 in our journey of joy together this year in the book of Romans. Left you with the good news that there therefore is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, thank you, I got one, all right. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is good news, yeah, that's right. That is good news, that means there's no penalty for our sin. There's no condemnation. God is no longer angry at us. Uh, We have a relationship with God that nothing can stand between us. God is for us who can be against us. God can't love us any more today than he loved us right now. He won't love us any less than what he loves us right now. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are the church, the body of Christ. That is good news. And that's where I left you a number of weeks ago with that good news Paul was sharing with with us in Romans chapter 8, that we've been justified, declared righteous, that we have power over sin, that we have power from sin, that in every way God has set us free. Life is good in Jesus Christ. Do you agree with me this morning? That's the message Paul has been giving us. I was blessed while I was away on vacation. Uh, Pastor Keenan, what an incredible job, Sermon on the Mount, right? Wow. Uh, Life is good. Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount that life is good. There's no better way than to follow Jesus Christ. That's exactly Paul's message in Romans chapter 8. And uh, you've seen it before. You've watched on Facebook, Instagram, everybody posting pictures. And what they're posting and what they're trying to say is life is good, right? And there's nothing better than getting away on vacation. I can attest to that over the last couple weeks. Uh, We were blessed to go on a a little cruise down to the Caribbean. Here's a picture of Amy and I while we were gone. I want you to see that life was good. We had a great time. You've seen the pictures before on Instagram where everybody puts their pictures up, their feet up with their their drink of choice next to them and the the beautiful clear ocean. Here's my picture for that right there. That's my picture. And uh, tried to get away, enjoy vacation. Uh, My drink of choice is a mango smoothie. And uh, life was good. But if you look at my picture, we got here at at this port and we were just enjoying the scenery and the beach here. And you can see down in the lower left-hand corner, there's my cell phone. I just just couldn't get away. I just couldn't get away. Uh, Life and a vacation is great to get away, but you know what was still on my mind? What was happening back home, what was happening in my family, what was happening in my church family, I had a chance to get connected, and we need that rest, don't we, we need, we need to get away, that's what vacation is all about, life is good, but the reality of life is that it, it doesn't always feel good, does it? Paul, in the midst of telling the, the Roman Christians that life is good, And that everything is great. There's no condemnation. We have a a total connection with God. Everything is good. In the midst of saying that to the, the Roman Christians of that day in the first century, it was needed because in that first century, Roman Christians were suffering. They were being martyred and killed for their faith. That Paul, as Paul was telling them that life in Jesus Christ is so good, they were dying. They were being lit on fire. They were Roman candles. They were put in that beautiful Colosseum. They were made sport of. At every turn, Christians in the first century were were suffering. And the reality of that message Paul was giving to those early Christians is is the same thing that we face today. Is that we say that in Jesus Christ, life is good, and yet they're suffering. How do we reconcile those two things together? In fact, today, you know, as we look at a relationship with Jesus Christ and we think of suffering, that is the reason why many people stop following Jesus Christ. That's the big question that people are asking. Why is there suffering in the world? Why all this evil? Why doesn't God just do something? And just like Instagram and Facebook, people who are following Jesus all of a sudden unfollow Jesus. With a click, they just say that's enough. I've had enough. 
What do we do as Christians with suffering today? If God has promised us the good life, the better life, that message of the Sermon on the Mount that you heard from Pastor Keenan, God has promised us a better way, a good way in Jesus Christ. How do we reconcile this idea of suffering that we face each and every day? That's why we love vacation. Because it's a chance to try to get away from the reality of life, the struggle of life, the challenge of life, the things that we face every day in life. When uh, Jesus was preaching that Sermon on the Mount, you remember as Pastor Keenan was sharing with us, happier are those who mourn, happier, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, happier are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Blessed means, it's a comparative statement, which means happier are these people living this way than this way. How do we experience that and say that life is really good in Jesus Christ while we live in a world of such incredible suffering? That's Paul's message today to the early Christians in the first century who were suffering and being martyred for their faith. He was teaching them how they could live the happy life in Jesus Christ. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 through 48. He said, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. The children of God act like their Father. We love and pray for our enemies who persecute us. For God causes the Son, His Son, the Son that rises On the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, in other words, as Christians, the good life is found right here amongst the righteous and the unrighteous, amongst the good and the evil. God sends the sun up and sends the rain down on the good and the evil alike, on the righteous and the unrighteous. We all live in the same place. And he says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same, those considered to be the bad people? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you, what more are you doing than others? If you just greet the people that like you and that know you, he says, do not even the Gentiles do the same? He says, therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. As my children, I want you to be like me in this world. I want you to think like me, act like me, be like me, have character like me. I want you to be whole and complete like me. I want my children to be like me. How do we do that? How do we live the good life that God has promised in a world that is so racked with suffering and challenges and problems and distractions. How do you do that? Because the truth is it's that suffering, those struggles and those challenges cause people who follow Jesus to suddenly unfollow Jesus, to just click off on Jesus and try another way. How do we live the good life? That's what Paul is addressing. If you were with us a few weeks ago when I left you in Romans chapter 8, Paul was describing this beautiful relationship that we have with God. We call him Abba Father. This intimacy with God that is just so close and so personal. All that Paul's been describing in the book of Romans to this point. That God can't love us any more than he loves us today. He won't love us any less than he loves us right now. That our sin will have no effect on that. That our sin we have conquered through Jesus Christ. That we have power over sin. That God is sanctifying us, setting us apart from sin. There is victory in every way. Life is good being the church of God, the body of Christ, Paul has been teaching. And he finished verse 17 this way. If you remember, we didn't really comment on it, but it just kind of tacked it on. Verse 17, Romans chapter 8. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. And since we're children, we're heirs also. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. And then he throws this on. If indeed or since or because we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified 
with him. God has something great planned for us in the future. (laughs) We're going to be glorified with him. That sanctification process where we have power over sin, God is going to make us like Jesus. We are going to be complete and whole in him on that day. But that day is coming still. And today we suffer with him. How do we live in this victory? How do we live the good life? That's what Paul's talking about to these Christians who in the first century were being martyred for their faith, following Jesus, not ashamed of the gospel. How they could experience the good life, like they're on vacation. You know, that picture that's in your mind of what that moment of relaxation feels like. How do we experience that in the midst of all the struggles? That's what Paul is talking about in the text this morning. How do we live the good life? Here's the principle, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be be revealed to us. We've seen that phrase before here, I consider or for consider. It's logizomai in the Greek. Remember, it's to credit or to put to your account, to reckon to your account. Paul, you remember, he said, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ. Put that in your bank every day, that sin has no power over you. You're alive to Jesus Christ. Now he says, I want you to put this in your account. I want you to put this in your bank. I want you to consider this. I want you to believe that this is true, that the sufferings of this present time The sufferings uh, in the Greek, what befalls you, whatever is happening to you, whatever your circumstance or situation is this morning, whatever your struggle or your challenge, I want you to consider this. I I want you to put this into your account about the sufferings of the present time, that they are not worthy, that there is no weight to them. They're not deserving to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul is saying that, Your perspective today, living in this world, in your relationship with Jesus Christ, is to keep your eye on the prize about what's coming and not focused on the troubles of this world. That the prize is found in Jesus Christ. That the comparative life that Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, happier, blessed are those, happier are those that live this way rather than this way. That if you want to experience the good life today, if you want to know that life is good today as the church of God, in the midst of all the suffering that's in our world, that all the problems you're facing, keep your eye on the prize. When you get to the finish line, at the end, you're going to find out that there's, even, there's no weight to the present suffering. You're going to find out this was nothing compared to what God has promised to us. That's what he's saying. Keep your eye on the prize. That's what he's talking about. And that's what he was trying to convince those early Christians of in the first century. Because they were suffering. They were being martyred for their faith. They were being uh, criticized for following Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul started the whole book. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. I'm not going to be ashamed. I believe in Jesus Christ. Paul says what's coming for us is so great, it won't, there'll be no comparison. And you can have that good life now by keeping your eye on the prize of what is coming to us. I want to talk to you about the realities in the text. There's just three realities, but I want to give you three myths that people believe about this idea of suffering that cause them to unfollow Jesus in their life. I don't want that to happen to you. But many Christians first believe this myth, that Christians... When you become a Christian, that Christians will suffer less in this life. That if you follow Jesus, life is going to be easier than those that don't. And if not not just easy, at least easier. That there'll be less problems when I follow Jesus. That somehow I'll be immune to all the evil and the suffering of the world. That's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, look, uh, uh, the sun comes up on, on the, the evil and the good. The rain comes down on the righteous and the unrighteous. We all live in the same place. You see, you just have to consider Jesus' life, the most righteous person who ever lived. The most compassionate person that ever lived. The most loving person that ever lived. The most perfect person that ever lived. Did he suffer less? 
Paul said in verse 18, Romans chapter 8, the principle, for I consider, and you should consider, you should put it in your account, that the sufferings of this present time, the suffering is now, he says. We're going to experience it now. And the, the reason why that is true is because G, even though Jesus has won the sin over victory and the total redemption is coming, we still live in a world filled with sin. We still live in a world where the enemy is yet to be locked up, where he is still active. We still live in these bodies of flesh that learn to live without God that Paul was talking about. We've been talking about that spiritual battle. We still live in these bodies, in this sinful world. And so there, there's still a struggle until this final redemption comes, Paul says. And because that's true, we should expect that there'll be suffering we should plan that there'll be suffering that's what Jesus was telling us happier or blessed is the person who lives this way rather than this way then I'm going to teach you how to have the good life to say life is good in the midst of the storm that's what Jesus was saying not that we would be exempt from it the Apostle Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. He said, For what credit is there if when you sin and you're harshly treated, you endure it with patience? In other words, what, what credit is there if you live a sinful life and then you have to pay for it? You, know, you have bad things happen in your life. What, what credit is that? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. You know, we're, we're willing to suffer for the bad things we did, but why am I suffering for doing the right thing? That's what the early Christians were saying. That's why many people unfollow Jesus today. Why am I suffering for doing the right thing? Verse 21, for you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Peter's saying you, you better plan on suffering in this world. You're not going to suffer less. It's not going to be easier. But plan that it's going to happen. And how are you going to deal with the suffering that comes from living in this broken world? Keep your eye on the prize, Paul says. It, it, what's coming, you can't compare to the suffering that we're going to face today, Paul says. Jesus even warned us of that. He said, in me, you're going to have peace. You're, you're going to experience the good life in me. There'll be peace. But in the world, there's going to be tribulation. Take courage. I've overcome the world, Jesus said. Keep living in me. Happier are those who do it this way rather than this way. Keep following me. That's Paul's message. The first myth that we often think is that for Christians we won't suffer. Life will just be easier. That's not true. If you think that way, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be tempted by the enemy to unclick off of Jesus and stop following him. Plan that you're going to face struggle in your life. Keep your eye on the prize. The second myth I'd say to you this morning is that often people think that suffering is caused by a specific sin in life. Now that certainly is true in some cases, just as the Apostle Peter has said. Sometimes suffering does come in our life because of specific sin. And so the Bible says we just need to confess it to God and move on. God's not going to love you anymore or any less because of your sin. That's already settled. He's declared you righteous. Nothing's ever going to change that. So if you're sinning and your sin, uh, your suffering is caused by your sin, confess it, make a change, repent, turn around, great. But sometimes suffering doesn't come because of our sin. Sometimes suffering comes because we follow Jesus Christ and we live in a broken world. See, the reality is, is not every sin come, not every bit of suffering comes from sin. Jesus suffered incredibly here on earth, and he never sinned. You see, sin sometimes happens, because, or suffering happens because of our sin. It was true for Jonah. He found himself in the belly of a well because of his sin. The prodigal son found himself in a pigsty because of his sin. But suffering doesn't always happen because we're sinning. It's just part of being in a broken world, in a sinful world, until that day of total redemption comes. 
No greater example of that in life, if we're looking for a human person, than Job. Here's Job's description in Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. How would you like that on your grave marker? Wow. Blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. But Job lived in the same world we do. He lives in a world where the enemy is still active, in a world system that opposes God, in a flesh that learned to live without God and is battling against the purposes of God. He was righteous and and upright, and yet he suffered greatly. You see, this is a reality of our journey here. And if you believe the myth that somehow that, that we're going to skate by in this world without that, you're going to be tempted to click off of Jesus. That's what Paul is saying to these Roman Christians who are suffering in the first century, dying for their faith. The third myth I tell you about suffering is that, that often we say today, because it's in the text this morning, that that when I suffer, after the suffering is over, then it's all going to make sense. I'll understand what God was actually doing, why I suffered. And if you've gone through that, you know that's not true. In fact, we try to comfort one another with the words in this text this morning in Romans 8, verse 28. We often quote this. Not just you, I've done it myself. And, and we want to clear that by, in the text this morning. We often say we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those that love God and called according to his purpose. And that is true. We know that God is always doing something in the midst of our suffering. But a lot of Christians believe that after it's over, we're going to see why. (laughs) That we're going to know why God did that. And when you can't see it or you don't understand why God did it, the enemy tempts us to, to click off of Jesus And unfollow him because it didn't make sense to us. But the promise is that you can know God is always working his purpose out in your life. Even when we don't understand that. Look, sometimes we understand, right? Uh, You're driving a clunker car and you need a new car and you can't figure it out. And what's going on? And all of a sudden you wait and you're saving your money. And all of a sudden someone offers you their car for no cost. And you go, oh man, yeah, now I see what God was doing. And now you got all this money saved and a car. And you go, man, man, I, I, I really wanted this job and I didn't get this job. And what's God doing in my life? And then all of a sudden the next week you get this dream job. And you go, oh, yeah, I see what God was doing in my life. But don't kid yourself. It's a myth if we think every time God is working, we're going to understand what God is doing. God's ways are not our ways. Who defeats a city by marching around it seven times and the walls come tumbling down? We don't know the way God's going to do it, but we trust him and we quote that verse because we know God is always doing something. But it's a myth to believe that we're always going to understand why we suffer. Those are myths that keep us from experiencing what God is trying to teach us in the midst of our struggle. The principle is very simple. Verse 18, for I consider, you should consider, we should consider We should put it in our bank that the sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory, with the total redemption that is coming. When we get to heaven, we'll look back and go, man, I don't even remember that. (laughs) That wasn't even a big deal. God's not trying to minimize our struggle. He just wants you to know you have power over the struggle if you keep your eye on the prize. That's how we overcome suffering in this life. That's how, we, that's how we experience the good life. That's how we can say life is good in the midst of the struggle. And so that's what Paul teaches us in this passage. What he's teaching those Christians that are suffering. He teaches them three simple principles that we'll just race through this morning. First he tells them this. That the complete and total redemption is coming. He's promised us that he's going to take care of it all. That this total redemption is on its way. Romans 8, 19 through 23 in the text. He says, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly 
for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from the slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The creation is suffering just like we're suffering, waiting for total redemption. The world is falling apart. God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth, the Bible tells us. The world is suffering as well as we're waiting for this total redemption to take place. For we know the whole creation groans and suffers pains of childbirth together until now. The the world is suffering just like a pregnancy, but the pregnancy's coming, the new birth is coming, the new heaven and earth are coming, but there's some suffering leading up to that. The world understands that. Creation understands that, and not only this, verse 23, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly, for our adoptions as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. There's coming a day when God is going to lock up the enemy. He will no longer have any say. There's one day God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to restore what he's created. There's coming a day when this body of flesh, with all the pain and struggle and groans of a life of sin, is going to be given a new body, a heavenly body. What a great day that's going to be. You know what the Bible calls that? Heaven. No more sin, no more enemy, no more broken world. Everything will be made new. Revelation 21 describes it this way. He'll wipe away every tear from your eyes. There's no longer going to be any death. No sin. There'll be no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And the one who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Keep your eye on the prize. Consider that the present sufferings, there's no way to be compared to what is coming. Keep your eyes on the prize. And you can experience that life is good today in the midst of your suffering and struggle. Amen? Amen. That's what God's promising to us. That he is going to bring total redemption. The second promise he makes in the text that Paul is saying to the Christians that are suffering in the first century. He says, God's going to sustain us until that day. That day is not here yet. We're in the present day of suffering. But that day is coming. And God says, look, you don't just have to do it on your own till that day comes. I'm going to sustain you till that day. Here's what he says to them. You're going to just trust me. And you're going to do it in hope. You can't can't see it yet. Hope is that it's coming. You remember Paul talked about hope with Abraham and his faith when we started in the book of, of Romans. And he gave the example of faith of Abraham. God called him out. He was going to make a great nation. He was going to do it as, as many sands on the seashore. And yet Abraham was an old man and his wife was an old lady. And she was barren. And how are they going to have this make this great nation when they couldn't even have one child and the bible says that abraham just trusted god he had faith he hoped in him and his hope made his faith grow stronger he didn't look at his circumstances his suffering all the impossibilities he's just kept looking at the prize of what god told him and he believed it and it's described this way in verse 24 24 and 25 for in hope we have been saved but hope is that that is seen uh, is not hope For who hopes for what he's already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Keep your eye on the price. Keep hoping for what God has promised. He's going to sustain you. And here's how he's going to do it in verse 26. In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself, he intercedes, he steps in for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for us, the saints, according to the will of God. And because we know that, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love him, to those that are called according to his purpose. 
He says, I know <laughs> the time is coming. Total redemption is coming. I promised you that. But I promise I'm going to sustain you till you get there. You need to stay intimately connected with me, which is what prayer is. Talking with God about the weaknesses that we struggle with every day. Get in connection with me so I can release my power in your life. And he's talking about deep suffering, deep groaning. The, the kind where we can't even, you know, when you're praying, you go, I don't even know what to pray. I mean, I'm hurt so deeply. The suffering is so bad. I don't even know what to say to God. I don't even know what to ask him for. God says, my spirit is going to come in to you. He's going to live in you. He's going to take what you're trying to say to me, and he's going to pray for me. The Spirit of God is going to come in and take what we can't even express with words. words. The groanings are too deep. He's going to groan for us. He's going to talk to God about what we can't even express ourselves. Too great of pain and suffering that God, he's in the groanings of the Spirit going to speak it to the Father on our behalf. Isn't it great when people say, I'm going to pray for you? I love when people say they're going to pray for me. I always say, keep praying for me. Don't stop. But you know what's better than people praying for you? The Spirit of God praying for you. That when you're suffering and struggling in your weakness, the Spirit of God is praying for you. Taking your needs and your struggles before the Father. Say, God, here's what Tate really needs. He doesn't even know what he needs. He's praying about this, but what he really needs is this. And he interprets it, gives it to the Father, and then the Father gives me exactly what I need. I don't even know what I need, but he gives it to me. So that in my suffering... I can say life is good. Wouldn't you like to be able to say that in your life? Not just for two weeks when you go on vacation. <laughs> oh, man. God knows we need that rest, doesn't he? That's why he gave us the promise of daily rest found in Jesus Christ. Because life is good in Jesus Christ. That's Paul's message to the Christians who are suffering and dying in the first century. Life is good in him. Stay connected to him. And he makes this, he makes this third promise. He, he promises there's going to be total redemption. He promises he's going to sustain us until that day. And then he promises that God is going to finish what he started. You can count on it. Verse 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Sometimes we hear those predestination words and we want to get into kind of a theological discussion about what all that means, but it's very simple what, what Paul is talking about here. He's saying those that God foreknew, the ones that God planned, your life that he planned out before you even became conceived in your mother's womb when God said, I'm going to create you in your mother's womb. But he foreknew that before that even happened. He predestined the outcome. In other words, he said predestination is that God had a plan for your life when he put you in your mother's womb and he's going to work it out in your life. And he tells us exactly what that is. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. To be perfect as our father is perfect. That as a child of God, God had you in mind, put you in your mother's womb when you were born. He made a plan for your life that you were going to become just like Jesus. Because you're a child of God. You're going to reflect your father in heaven. He's going to use the sufferings of this world so that you will look and act like Jesus Christ. That life can be good in the midst of that process. And in that struggle of this moment where God is doing that work and sanctifying, there will come the day of total redemption when we will be like him. But there's a challenge to that day. He says, and in that challenge, don't worry, I'm going to be with you. The Spirit's going to be with you, praying for you, sustain you all the way through. And I promise you, I'm going to finish the job. <laughs> Isn't that great news? God, uh, Paul said it this way right in Philippians. I'm confident in this very thing that he who began a good work in you will what? Perfected, completed on the day of Christ Jesus. That's the promise that he is making. Verse 30, and these whom he predestined, these he made the plan with, he also called them. He chose you. 
And these whom he called, he justified. That's what we've been talking about in the book of Romans. We've been justified. God declared us righteous. We couldn't get there if God didn't do that. So he sent Jesus that we're going to celebrate in a moment around the communion table to justify us, to declare us righteous, to do the work of the cross so we can take our sin problem, have it done away with. We can have total intimacy with God. God will no, love us not any more than he does now or any less than he does now, no matter what we're doing in our journey till heaven. And those he has justified, he also glorifies. That he's sanctifying us, setting us apart in this journey. And when we get to heaven, that total glorification will come. A whole new body, a whole new place, a whole new world with Jesus Christ. The Bible calls that heaven. And he's promised it to you. And he's saying to those early Christians, he's saying to us today, I know there's going to be suffering. Don't fool yourself. Don't believe the myths that it's going to be easier. You're going to get away from it because you're a Christian. They didn't have to tell them in the first century they were dying in the arena. They are being set on fire. They are being thrown off of buildings. They were having their heads cut off. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. This is going to be a blip on your radar when you get to glory. You won't even remember it. And God says, I'm going to sustain you through it. So where does your help come from? Yeah. The psalmist says, I lift my eyes up to the mountains, for where shall my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not fall asleep. The Lord your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun won't smite you by the day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. You feel your foot slipping today? Losing your grip? The good news is it's not dependent on you or me. He's got you. The Lord has you today. In the midst of your struggle, whatever you're facing, whatever your challenge, the Lord has you. Keep your eye on the prize, Paul says. Don't get distracted. Don't let the enemy confuse you. The Lord has you. Keep your eye on the prize. That's what Paul is saying. I want to introduce you as we close today as we prepare to meet in communion together of an older lady. She's 72-year-old Fran. I think her name is Drotz. I put her on the screen for you this morning. She ran in the 2016 Boston Marathon. She's 72 years old. She finished uh, the race in 2016 in 26,639th place. She finished dead last. And when she had finished the uh, race at 72, there were, weren't any uh, roaring crowds there. There weren't any uh, uh, coronations of the officials there. They weren't giving away any ribbons or medals at that point. In fact, the workers were already pretty much done tearing down the stands and the barricades when she crossed the finish line as she crossed. 8.45 that night. She had run 75 marathons in her life. This wasn't her first marathon, but she was now 72. And she was running this marathon for a cancer institution because she was running for her husband who was suffering cancer for the third time. She, it took her so long she it took, took her to cross so the finish line that her, her husband had to call officials earlier, called the police earlier because she, he thought maybe she had got lost in the race, didn't know where she was. That's how far she was in last place when she crossed the finish line. There was nobody there. The officials, the stands were gone. Everything was put away except for one person. Her husband was there waiting for her. The person that she was running for. And he had a medal for her. <laughs> I'll guarantee you this today. But when you run for Jesus, 
He will be there waiting for you with a medal. It doesn't matter what place you get here on earth. You will be first place in Jesus' heart. And he promises you that in the suffering and in the struggle and in the challenges of life, if you run for him, he will sustain you till that day. Amen? And it's all possible because of what Jesus has done for us, what we celebrate today, the work of the cross that has set us free. Father, I pray today that as we commune together with you, that you would remind us of the work of the cross that has set us completely free. Not free from the, the suffering and the challenges and the problems of this life. But it set us free so that we can have the victory to live the good life in the midst of the struggles. And so as we prepare to meet with the Lord this morning, uh, I just want to give invitation with your head bowed, eyes closed. There are people here this morning that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't know the good news of Jesus. You've been living, running on your own. You don't even know who you're running for. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ. You want to be set free. You want a new life. You want your sins forgiven. You want to have the certainty of heaven waiting for you to see Jesus on that day saying, well done. If you want that this morning, I'm just going to pray a simple prayer. And in your heart this morning, if that's what you believe and want, you can surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You can say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. For dying on the cross for me. For forgiving me of my sin. I surrender my life to you. I invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me. You are the King of my life. Father, I pray for those that have made that choice today to follow you, that this would be a new journey for them. Help them to keep their eyes on the prize.